welcome to GameSack. As you can see, Dave and myself are part of the 1%, the elite, the upper class. Dave, how did we achieve such status? Well, Joe, we received the status by not spending a lot of money on our video games. Indeed. And we're going to show you how to do that in this easy to follow guide on what games you can buy for a relatively low amount of money. And that are still fun to play. Gen War by Jumping Jack Software for the Saturn is one that's not too expensive and nobody ever talks about. This one goes for about $12 on average. Basically the story is that the Gen aliens have been helping humans with technology but now have turned on them for some reason. And now it's up to you to eradicate all of the Gen. The story is told through lots and lots of FMV cutscenes which don't look too bad for the Saturn. The meat of the game is spent inside the cockpit of a mech type device with various abilities and weapons. Each mission will usually have a few different objectives to accomplish. You have a decently large area to wander around in in order to complete these tasks. You have a map at the bottom left corner of the screen but it doesn't differentiate between enemies and other random items that just might be laying around. However, you can pause the game at any time to get a better overall view of the map. I think that the main problem with this game is that your mission objectives are vague at best. You're left to discover most things on your own. The map does not light up with where you need to go next or anything like that. Some missions are pretty tough, like taking out these towers. They light up when you get close, which prevents you from jumping and firing your weapons. If you get far enough away for them to turn off their lights, it's hard to hit them and you run out of ammo. And then you've got to run around the stage and get more ammo, and that gets kind of boring. And that's because it just feels like I'm not really making any progress. Also, when you do beat a stage, do not press X. Do not do it, because that takes you back to the title screen. The game's visuals are pretty bleak with a very limited draw distance. The sound and music are okay, but the music doesn't play all the time. Overall, the game controls fine. It's not a bad game, really. I just feel it could be better. However, playing with the Saturn mission stick increases the fun factor. I mean, look at my face as I play with a regular Saturn controller. Now look at my face as I play with the Saturn mission stick. That's how much extra excitement it brings! Overall, truthfully, it's an average game, but it's worth $12 or so. Alright, this is Death Duel on a Genesis from Razorsoft. It turns out that by the year 2140, civilization has advanced to the point where all disputes must be settled by a duel to the death. You play as the mechanized robot thingy that you see in the title screen. You trudge back and forth on the playfield looking for your enemy and firing on him with the weapons that you have available to you. Your life bar is on the bottom whereas your foes is on the top of the screen. Obviously the enemy will return fire and whoever's life bar fills up the first loses the match. And after the match you need to shoot bugs to qualify for the next stage and who doesn't like that? I like how you're reminded of the game's name during all of this just in case you've forgotten and need to go tell your friends to buy it. Anyway, after this there's a shop where you can repair your damage and buy more ammo and whatnot. And of course, almost everything is extremely expensive and unaffordable. As you can see, it's a tremendously exciting game. That is if boredom excites you for some sick reason. <laughs> I must, you're watching GameSack. The game tries to be bloody and gory, but honestly it's pretty tame. It's also kind of hard to be grossed out by weird armored aliens falling apart. Ultimately, it gets old pretty fast because your weapons and ammo are just too limited and so is the game's clock. The graphics really aren't anything special at all. Well, except for the ring girls, I guess. Must be cold outside. The sound is awful all around and so is the music in the rare instance that it actually plays. The box makes a big deal about the game's 8 MEGA POWER and even includes it in the title. Like a lot of games, this one's cheap for a reason. This is Mickey Mania, the timeless adventures of Mickey Mouse developed by Traveler's Tales and published by Sony ImageSoft. I'm playing the Genesis version here, but it's also available on the Super Nintendo and the Sega CD. Why is a Nintendo fanboy choosing to play the Genesis version over the Super Nintendo, you ask? Well, it's simple, really. Traveler's Tales put more effort into the Genesis release and they kind of half-assed the poor old Nintendo release. I really don't want to get into all the differences between the versions here, as I'd want to save that stuff for a future episode. 
but I'll mention just a couple of the very many differences between each version. Right off the bat, in the Genesis version of Steamboat Willie, the first few moments of the level have an old film feel to it with scratches and moving sprocket holes on the side. This doesn't happen in the Super Nintendo version and why I'm not sure because it really adds to the feeling that you're playing an old cartoon. Next, after you rescue Pluto from the mad scientist in the next level, Mickey at least acknowledges Pluto in the Genesis version. In the Super Nintendo version, Mickey just walks right by Pluto as if he's just part of the background. Poor old Pluto, I guess if you're not Mario, nobody really cares about you. Anyways, let's talk about the game. As the title states, the game is all about the timeless adventures of Mickey Mouse. It lets you play as Mickey and relive moments from some of his most popular cartoons. Six of them in all, and there's definitely a great variety represented here. If it were me though, I would have picked a few of his other classics to represent here, but it's not me, so I'll just appreciate what I was given. Overall, the game is fun and very enjoyable. Each cartoon is broken up into multiple areas to navigate. Some of these are really short, and just when you feel you're getting startled, the level is over. Mickey controls fairly well, and there's only a few times where I felt it could have controlled better, like here where I'm pretty sure I landed on this platform, but I went right through it. Also, Mickey seems to have a big hitbox for damage, as some of the hits he's taken are very questionable. And a lot of things damage Mickey. Those damn skeletons in the Mad Doctor level that break apart are a serious pain. Their bones fly all over and each one will cause damage if it touches you. This elevator ride is the worst part. I can do it now and take very few hits, but at first it was very frustrating and I got hit every time. It's all good though, as you can take five hits before you die and you can refill your life bar a bit by collecting stars which are scattered throughout the levels. Graphically, the game is truly something to behold. The artwork and all the sprites and backgrounds is right on par with the cartoons that they come from. Oh, and the scaling and rotation effects are very well done. I'm really surprised at the Genesis for being able to pull off this rotating tower. It simply looks amazing to me. And for some stupid reason, this level isn't in the Super Nintendo version. Then of course, you have a great soundtrack to round it all out. Even though the Genesis is the better version here, the Super Nintendo entry is still very playable and looks almost as good. You can't go wrong either way, and since both versions can be found for under $15, I think you should buy this game. Now, if you have an extra $40 laying around, you can get the pinnacle Sega CD version, which has a lot of voices and better music, but that's up to you and your budget. Lotus Turbo Challenge on the Genesis is a racing game from 1992. It was programmed by Gremlin Graphics and released by EA and can be played by one or two players. This one averages around $6 because it's really not that much in demand. And it's as basic as it gets. You have acceleration and brakes and you have a choice of manual shifting if you want. You've got no turbos or speed boosts of any kind. However, you do have a yeehaw button. They even dedicated a section to it in the manual. The game plays well with each stage being a long route from point A to point B. After each checkpoint you pass, each stage will change a little bit in the kind of hazards you gotta avoid. The control is great, but the problem is that the countdown timer is extremely unforgiving. Damn, it's tough. The graphics are very minimal. There is one stage though where you race on a highway and there's traffic all over the place, but that's as awesome as it gets. There's no music during gameplay, and except for the occasional digitized sound, it sounds like a Master System game. In fact, that's what I told the dude at Buyback Games when he asked how I liked it back when I rented this one in 1992. There's not too much 16-bitness going on here, but it's cheap, and that's what's important. Checkpoint. The next year, they followed it up with Lotus 2, also on the Genesis. This one's still pretty basic, but they did improve some things. The graphics are slightly better now and feature a bit more detail in the tracks. You can also choose from three different cars to race as. The timed races are still hard as hell, but there's also a championship mode where you don't race the clock. Instead, you're just trying to get to first place and progress. You have a limited amount of fuel, and if you're not careful, it's going to run out. You refuel by pulling over and stopping when the pit icon flashes and then watch your rank rapidly decrease. Ah <laughs> yes, last place for me please. There's even a choice of music tracks to listen to this time. They're not too bad, but you can't have both music and sound effects at the same time for some reason. It's a better game than the first, but it's still not amazing. However, it is a bit cheaper than the first as this one's only around 5 bucks.
When you think cheap, affordable games, you think Neo Geo. And Art of Fighting 2 from SNK is one of those cheap games. It's cheap in more ways than one, actually. I'll get to that in a bit. Now, as you might be able to guess, this is the second game in the Art of Fighting series. And this series is known for its gigantic character sprites and its constant scaling zooming in and out all over the place, almost to a distracting degree. But honestly, you do get used to it, and the rest of the presentation is pretty damn good. The graphics are all top-notch for an early fighting game on the system featuring 178 mega power. The audio is pretty good and there's absolutely nothing to complain about in that area. Hell, a few of the tunes are actually pretty damn catchy. Gameplay-wise, A punches, B kicks, and C throws, and also kind of attacks if you're not in range to throw. The longer you hold down on the button, the stronger your attack. I found this kind of hard to get used to. There's a chi meter underneath your life bar that drains as you use your special moves. When this is empty, your attacks become very weak. You can recharge your chi by standing still and holding both the A and B buttons down, but this leaves you vulnerable. But guess what? Your enemy also has to do this. Honestly though, I didn't really feel like this added too much to the game. It's still fun though. After each third stage, you play a bonus round of your choice in hopes of increasing your character's ability, which is really cool. But be warned, the single player mode in this game is super cheap in that it blocks nearly all of your attacks and advances. It's very frustrating to play at times. The two player mode is of course immune to this as no human player will ever be as cheap as the CPU. If you have a friend to play with, I really do recommend it. The Japanese version for the AES sells between $38 and $50 online and that's the one you want. That's cheap as hell for a Neo Geo game. Hell, I picked up my copy at a local video game shop for just $35. It also came out on the Super Famicom under its Japanese name Ryuko no Ken 2. Of course, it's pretty watered down, but it does have the scaling backgrounds. It also has separate buttons for light and strong attacks, and that's pretty nice. As a game, it's a little easier, but it's still pretty tough. And thanks to the lovely reverb, the fight sounds like it's taking place inside an empty barrel. It goes for about the same price as the Neo Geo version, maybe a little bit cheaper, so it's not really an outstanding budget title for the Super Famicom, but it's there if you want it. Of course, I'm gonna prefer the Neo Geo version. It's a great game, but SNK hates your life if you play alone. Hey. Well, well, we are off to a great start, and as you can see, we've saved a lot of money so far. Isn't that correct, Joe? Indeed. I have a mansion and a yacht. I have two mansions and two yachts. <laughs> Indeed. And we're not done. We're going to show you more games that you can save money on so you can have a mansion and a yacht. This is Black, published by EA and developed by Criterion Games. Yep, the same Criterion that made the awesome Burnout Racing series. I'm playing the game on the Xbox, but it's also available on the PS2. However, both versions run in 480p and are displayed in 16x9. I do own both versions and I find the analog stick on the Xbox is a bit more responsive. Anyway, this game was a very refreshing title when it was released in 2006. The other major first-person shooter series at the time were still wearing out the World War II themes and Black brought us something new and modern. Set in Russia, the game revolves around a soldier retelling his battles that he's been in trying to stop the 7th wave terrorist cell. Each level that you play through is set up by a cutscene of your character being interrogated. He smokes a lot and that made me really want a cigarette bad! <laughs> Just kidding. The cutscenes are cool, but they're constantly switching scenes and it's really annoying after a while. The overlaying story is interesting though and it sets up the next battle. Each mission looks great and is loaded with detail and is straightforward so you should never get lost. A map screen would have been a nice addition even though it's really not needed. Besides the main objective, you have to complete secondary objectives of finding and destroying enemy intel. It's not hard as it's usually just laying around which makes me wonder how this terrorist cell plans to be successful if they're so sloppy with their intel. Also laying all over the place are weapons for you to pick up. You can hold two at a time so pick and choose which ones you like. Don't worry about ammo as it can be found all throughout an area. You can also pick it up from downed enemies. Be sure to keep picking it up though because enemies take a ton of hits. 
Unless you have the sniper rifle or are really good at headshots, you will put 5 plus rounds into an enemy before they die. Besides great level design, Criterion added a lot more depth to the game by making most of the background destructible. Shooting walls will leave pockmarks. A lot of the environment can be taken out with gunfire and even the stuff your enemy is hiding behind. The same goes for you, so don't sit in one spot for too long. The guns are super detailed and from what I understand they behave and sound just like the real thing. Of course I've never shot an AK-47, a Spaz 12 gauge, or an RPG so I guess I'll have to take the developer's word for it. I like that after you've been shooting there's a small pile of shells below you. I really like that kind of detail. The only thing that I really don't care for is when you reload your weapon the whole screen goes blurry except for the gun. It's really a strange effect and I'd rather look at what I'm shooting at instead of how beautiful my gun looks. It is beautiful though. There's not a lot of music that plays during gameplay but what is here makes the game feel more suspenseful. Other times it's just ambient sounds and that's fine too. Even today the game is just fun to play and still looks pretty darn good. If you haven't played this one then what are you waiting for? It's very cheap and can be yours for around $10 and the enjoyment factor is definitely worth way more than that. Kitchen for the Genesis is made by the same dudes as Road Rash. The premise of this one is that you're a dude on rollerblades and you're racing other dudes on rollerblades. To go faster, you affix yourself to the backs of cars which will give you momentum to move up to the cars ahead of you and to get into first place. Well, that is until you mess up like I always do, like right here. Sometimes you'll have to beat off the other dudes that are attached to the same vehicle as you. Well, beat them up, I mean. Yeah. There are weapons laying in the middle of the street for you to collect and you can have up to three of them at a time. If you reach a high enough place, you move on to the next city. There's also a shop between rounds for you to buy extra gear just like in Road Rash. There's also a chance to earn some extra money on bonus tracks. Okay, as you can see here, I really, really suck at this game. I mean really suck. I find it very difficult to do what I want to do in the game. My on-screen guy often reaches for the wrong side of the street when I put out my hand waiting for a car to come up for me to grab. It feels like you spend the entire game watching this tiny rear view mirror at the bottom of the screen. And don't you dare take your eyes off of it. I sometimes have a hard time staying attached to certain vehicles and landing from a simple jump is also something I have difficulty with. Sadly, I face all of these difficulties in the very first level and it doesn't do a good job of teaching the player how to deal with the game like a good first level should. I mean, it keeps the cars to a single side of the road, but that's really about it. I feel like the gameplay could have been a little bit more streamlined. They tried to do so much with so few buttons. Personally, I think grabbing cars should be automatic if you're close enough. Honestly, I just don't enjoy playing this one and I never really have since I originally rented it back when it was released and that might anger some of you since this game has some passionate fans. But I'm not here to talk up the game for those who like it because they already own it. I'm here to tell you that it's cheap and you can usually find a boxed copy for less than 15 US dollars. And you might actually like it because a lot of people who play it do. The graphics are kind of low quality, but at least it has the same software scaling from the Road Rash games, even if the frame rate is pretty low. And each city is identical to the real deal. For example, this odd building here from Denver, that's real. We call this one the Cash Register Building. The music is technically impressive in its sound quality and it can be pretty damn catchy too. I can't imagine too many people not liking the music, but I'm sure there's some people. Honestly, even though I'm not personally a fan of the gameplay and would much rather play Road Rash, it is worth taking a chance on for such a low price if you don't have it. Here's Top Gear for the Super Nintendo, developed by Gremlin Graphics and published by Chemco. This title came out fairly early in the system's life and is an evolution of the Lotus games that Joe talked about. As you can see, it's a split-screen racer and I've always been curious as why the single-player mode has to have a split-screen. I mean, it's not like I have time to stare at my computer opponent's screen to see where they are, so why not make it full-screen? Just like any racing game out there, your goal is to finish in first place, believe it or not. In fact, if you don't finish in the top four positions, your game is over no matter where you stand in the overall rankings. Like here where I play seventh in this race, but overall I'm still in first place. This doesn't seem right, but what the hell, the game is so fun I don't mind starting over. When you start out, you can choose from four different cars and it's wise to pay attention to what car you choose. 
My advice is to pick a car with low fuel consumption. Sure, it doesn't have the top end speed, but as you get into later races, you have to start making pit stops to fuel up. And the farther you can go without making a pit stop, the better. No matter what car you choose, they all control very well and a low fuel gauge is the only thing that you're going to have to worry about. Graphically, the game is appealing and I like all the different countries that you race in. You have day and night races, which is cool. The tracks are all nicely designed and it's always fun figuring out the best place to use your turbo boosts. And to top it all off, the game boasts a great soundtrack that really is perfect music for driving. The game isn't expensive and I've seen some buy it nows on eBay for about $10. Top Gear 2, again by Gremlin Graphics and Chemco, came out a year later in 1993. There's a lot of exciting changes to this sequel that make for a better game in my opinion. Most notably is that single player is now full screen. Ah, that is so much more enjoyable. As far as setting up your game, you don't get to choose your car anymore. You're given a car that you can upgrade throughout the championship. It's very important to win races right off the bat here or you're going to be left behind. The game is more forgiving in that you can advance even if you do end up in a lower place. But again, you won't make any money to upgrade your car, so your game will be over real quick. And you can upgrade lots of parts on your car. Upgrading the engine, gearbox, tires, and front armor worked really well for me and I was always able to stay very competitive. Actually, armor might be one of the best things you can upgrade. One of the bigger problems with this game is that if your car gets damaged, its top speed dips way down and you can forget about catching up to anybody. Another slightly annoying thing is the developers love to put crap on the road for you to hit. It's a freaking racing game, why is this road cluttered with this stuff? Graphically, the game is better than the first one, and again you race in daytime, nighttime, and now there's weather effects of rain, snow, and fog. The music, while not as good as the first game, is still very enjoyable and is perfect for a racing game. This one is a bit more expensive, but can still be had for around $15. There's also Top Gear 3000. This one you race on other planets, but it usually costs more than $20. It's good, so maybe I'll talk about it some other time. But Top Gear 2 is a great one for a smaller price. And by now, you, like us, are incredibly wealthy, part of the 1%, which is now inflated to 2%, and you oppress everyone else. Feels good, doesn't it? It does. Anyway, what are some of your favorite games that don't really cost very much? Let us know, because maybe we'd like to buy them too and become even more rich. That's one of our favorite hobbies. Yes, oh, you're exactly right, Joe. And we would love to have more money in our pockets and not buy expensive games. Indeed. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. Well, hello, Joe. Well, hello, Dave. Wow, is this the wildly famous Panzer Dragoon Saga you hold in your hand? Why, yes it is. And how did you acquire such a gem? Did you happen to pay full price for this? <laughs> no, no, Dave. I oppressed some individual at a local convention for my copy. Oppression, you say? I'm impressed by your oppression. Did you happen to see my copy of Snatcher for the lovely Sega CD as well? I have not. Did you happen to oppress another fellow out of this one? No. I one percented my way into this copy, Dave. One percent, you say? You must teach me the ways of this one percenting. Indeed, Dave. But first, I believe we need to one percent ourselves some pants. Right-o, Joe.